Hi everyone, and welcome to another episode of Mr. Carlson's Lab. Let's get started. Here is an extremely neat piece of early digital technology. This is a Hewlett Packard 521C electronic counter. This is a frequency counter. Now, this is known as a decade-style counter, very early digital stuff, and anything early digital with vacuum tubes means a lot of vacuum tubes. So many vacuum tubes, in fact, this case is fan-cooled. We're going to open this up and take a look inside here in just a moment. So this is known as a decade-style counter, and in order to read this, say we were to put 10 kilohertz, a frequency of 10 kilohertz, into the input here. This should read 1 zero 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 or depending on where you have the gate selector it may read one zero 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 and it also depends on the frequency limitation now this is a, a i guess you could say a frequency limited device it goes to about 120 kilocycles or 120 kilohertz in modern speak so it is a really neat style counter now you could almost look at this as the way they would do things before they would use a nixie tube all right, so Nixie tubes are the operation of a Nixie tube in a case like this is very, very similar, actually. So these are all individual little neon bulbs behind here, and that lights up each one of these digits. Well, you can very easily convert something like this to use a Nixie tube, and in fact, they did. So each digit would just drive one of the segments inside of a Nixie tube. Very, very simple. And of course, in some of the other types of units, they did do that. But this is more fascinating because this is, well, technically, just think of all the neon bulbs in here. You know, we got 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 neon bulbs, and who knows however many other are hiding inside this, plus all the vacuum tubes. This thing is chocked full of glass. There is a lot of glass in here. So here's the thing. Do you think this thing is going to still work from 1957? There are a lot of tubes in here. Let's open the case up, take a look inside, we'll take a look around, and then I'll power this thing up, bring it up nice and slow, and we'll see if we can bring it to life. All right, let's take the case off this thing and see if we can get inside. So this is the top. It's a pretty big unit, and it is fairly heavy. On the bottom, as you can see, we have a filter for all of the air that's going to be flowing through this thing. Here's something rolling around in there, which isn't really a good sign. Let's take a look at the back. So this mat is nice and soft. So it looks like these two screws here might get us inside. So let's take a look. I haven't opened this thing up. You know as much as I do at this point. So let's see here. Yeah, I think these need to come all the way out. They're not like tech gear. Tech stuff was, you know, half a turn and the stuff would release. So this one here is going to have to be taken out all the way as well. Something was stuck on that. Okay, so, oh, yeah, that looks like it's going to be relatively easy to get this case off. So I'll get this cord ready. I don't know if I'm going to be able to lift this off here. This might hit the camera. So, maybe what I'll do is I will tip this back over and I'll slide it out the other way without pinching my fingers here. Okay, I'll move these screws. And already I'm seeing internals, which is a good thing. So I'll move this back over here. That is a lot of tubes. Wow, look at all these tubes. Move this forward. It's catching on something there. Gotta be careful the way I grab this. I don't wanna disturb anything. I don't wanna skew our test. So there it is. So I'll get this case out of the way and I'll reposition this. I'll be right back and we'll take a closer look at the circuitry. All right. I managed to prop this chassis up in just the perfect position with a bunch of rolls of tape here so we can, for a moment, bask in the amount of vacuum tubes that are inside this device. Look at this. This thing is full of tubes. I believe there's 44 tubes in this little case alone. So there are more tubes underneath here as well. So they're even putting tubes up on the bottom side, and we'll take a look at that in just a moment. 
Now I've looked at every single tube, just basically like this right now, and every single tube inside this device is branded Hewlett Packard. So there's an extremely good chance that this thing is all original. This will be a very neat test to see if this thing comes to life with all the original tubes from 1957. It should be very exciting. So even this tube here has got Hewlett Packard writing on it. Everything is just HP in this thing. So I'll turn this thing upside down and we'll take a look at the bottom side as well. Here's a look at the bottom side of the counter. And as you can see, there's a row of tubes on this side and a row of tubes on this side. They've put tubes in every nook and cranny inside this counter. So they've really utilized every little bit of space here. Now, one thing that would be very important would be this fan, and it spins very, very freely. I would imagine if this thing seized up, this transformer would definitely suffer from that. The amount of heat that would be held captive inside this case without any type of forced air or fan cooling would be rather incredible. So this is a good sign. This is a good sign. There's a good chance that this power transformer is going to be okay. So if we take a look at the side here, they're using all very high quality parts in this. They have domino style mica capacitors everywhere. These are ceramic disc capacitors. They're very dependable. This is a Sprague die film style capacitor. How do I know it's a die film capacitor? Well, it has red writing on it. So red writing in a red band means that it's a die film construction. If this had yellow writing on it with a yellow band, that would mean that it's a paper and foil construction and uh, those would be definitely bad by now. They're using all Allen Bradley style resistors with the squared off ends and the, you know, the nice smooth body on them, which means that these are, you know, a little bit more resilient to moisture ingression, whereas the older roundy style carbon composition resistors were, uh, you know, very prone to drifting just because moisture would get inside them. So these are all carbon composition resistors as well. It's, uh, you know, just a, I guess you could say a, a little newer design where they would, uh, be a little bit more resistant to uh, the atmosphere and things like that that uh, surround the device. So it's looking really nice. This one side here is really heavy device to be turning around. You can see all the nice construction here. It's put together very much like Tektronix gear with all the components like this. Very nice. We've got a bunch of adjustments in the side here. Lots more dependable components in here. It really looks like they designed this thing to really last. Every tube, Hewlett Packard, every single one. This one here has yellow writing on it. Whether it's original, which I would imagine it might be, just different color writing, different style of tube. Uh, usually when tubes are replaced in devices like this, they have a different name on them. So very, very uh, original looking. You can see all the neon bulbs. These are all neon bulbs in every device here. So I'll just uh, zoom in on this and tip this up. You can see all the neon bulbs tucked in behind all of the uh, the numbers here, zero to nine, right? So every module is like that. It's nice that they give you a, a nice little look inside the module here. So this would be the back side of the module, right? Because we're looking at this side. And then of course, if I was to flip this over, the same module on the other side, we would be taking a look at the other side of the board right here. So rather simplistic design. But again, you know, for the time, this was extremely high technology. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to bring this thing up very slowly and we're going to see if this thing comes to life with all these original vacuum tubes. Place your bets now. Okay, so I'm going to bring this thing up in stages because I don't want to hurt the electrolytic capacitors here and who knows how long it's been since this thing has actually been turned on. It is very clean inside which is quite surprising. So it looks like it's been most likely in a facility where it's probably been maybe even in a clean room or something like that. It is surprisingly clean, it really is. So what I'm going to do is turn on my isolation transformer and current limited variac supply, which I'm going to do right now. And I'll turn this on. So now this is limited. This is running through some bulbs right now. And I would imagine this is just gonna get, you know, just a little bit of uh, of the line because the bulbs are going to limit everything out. The bulbs were bright and now they're dimming out. That is normal. It should spin that slow because everything is reduced. The line voltage is reduced. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to let this sit here and spin just like this and come up for a while. 
And then what I'm going to do is flip the bypass switch on the bulbs and give this thing full line current. So I'm going to let this run like this for about 15 to 20 minutes, just to be nice and easy on the capacitors, and then I will be right back. Okay, I'm about to hit the bypass. Let's give this thing full current and see what happens. Well, it's running. And I do see life. So what I'll do is I'm going to reposition this. I'm going to shut this thing off. I'll reposition it. And let's take a look at all those tubes glowing. I don't want to touch this thing with this metal fan blade spinning here. Who can resist a look at all of these filaments glowing at the same time? Isn't that a thing of beauty? Okay, I needed to go grab a cup of coffee for this. So, let's see if this thing comes to life on the front side. Here we go. Turn this on. I better move my coffee out of the way because there's a fan spinning in the bottom and who knows where this thing's been sitting. Anything flung in my coffee. So here we go. have to remember not to lean into this thing. Look at that. I'm seeing life. Little digits are all lighting up and looks like it's somewhat coming to life. It's zeroed out, which is a really good sign. Now the next thing to do is to feed a signal into this thing. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to attach this to a signal generator and let's give it a signal and see if it gives us anything relevant. I have 10 kilohertz on this cable, so it's 10 kilohertz at one volt output. So it's one volt RMS out. And of course this isn't terminated into 50 ohms or anything like that, so it's going to be a little more than that, but good enough for the test. So let's find out. Here we go. What do you think is going to happen? 10 kilohertz. It's, it's living. This is amazing. So I'll turn this. This is the display time, so if I turn this up, it's going to slow things down. 10 kilohertz. Very, very close. Move this around. So 9996. And I believe this is using the 60 cycles to count this right now. The switch on the inside here was set to line as the reference. So if I move that, let's see what happens. Maybe the crystal inside might be off. Let's just see what happens. Yeah, it's out. So that's the reason it's most likely click to line. So we'll look into that during the restoration. So I'll turn this back here. Oh, very close. Not bad. So let's go back to this. So let's try, say, uh, 14 for the fun of it. Or maybe 20 kilohertz. Let's go 20. So 20 kilohertz. Here we go. Let's see what we get. Yeah, so the next one should be relevant. There it is. 19.99. Not bad. 20 kilohertz. Back up to here. 19993 it was 19995 so when that crystal is fixed up that should make this very accurate obviously you know this is using the line right now and there's a lot of other things making noise on the line there's tons of switch mode power supplies now and things like that around right so it's probably affecting this a little bit Not bad. Not bad. 19999. Pretty consistent. So, 1999, right? So, let's see. It's supposed to go to 100 kilohertz. So, or 120. Let's see if we can, uh, let's try just 60 for the fun of it. We might be pressing our luck. That's 60 kilohertz there. Not bad. 59,992. So 
60. Not bad there. All right. Let's try 100 kilohertz. 100 kilohertz. This is very impressive. This thing is really holding up. Look at that. 100 kilohertz. So let's try... It's supposed to go to 120. Let's try 120. 120 kilohertz. So 19,995. 119,995, right? Not bad. Let's try 130. 130 kilohertz. Not bad. It's holding up. Let's try 150. 150 kilohertz. Yeah, and it's losing it there. That's maximum sensitivity, right? So if I drive it, if I drove the front end a little bit harder, maybe by using a function generator or something like that, I might be able to get it up there. But come time for restoration, we'll go about experimenting with that. So put it back down to something comfortable. Let's go to, say, 5 kilohertz. That's very comfortable for this. There it is. Not bad. Not bad at all. So there you have it. 1957 technology still working with all of those vacuum tubes. So do you think any electronics built today will still be working in 70 plus years with nothing done to it? If you're enjoying my videos, you can let me know by giving me a big thumbs up and hang around. There'll be many more videos like this coming in the near future. We'll be taking a look at vacuum tube and solid state electronic devices alike. So if you haven't subscribed, now would be a good time to do that as well. If you want to be notified as soon as I post a new video, don't forget to tap the bell symbol. If you're interested in taking your electronics knowledge to the next level and learning electronics in a very different and effective way and gaining access to many of my personal electronic inventions and designs, you're definitely going to want to check out my ongoing electronics course on Patreon. I'll put the link just below the video's description under the show more tab and I'll also pin the link at the top of the comment section. So if you click on the link, it'll take you right there. All right, until next time, take care. Bye for now.